Well, welcome Pathway Church at all of our locations, Goddard Cafe, Valley Center, Westlink. Those of you who are watching online, so glad that you're here for this first weekend of our brand new series, It's You. Well, this weekend is really marks about the 12th year uh, that I've been the lead pastor here at Pathway Church. It was 12 years ago that they called and they said, It's you. Now, uh, that was a radical change for me. Uh, if you don't know my story, I mean, I was not a, a lead pastor before uh, this point in time. And I can remember just before I started, uh, I had uh, lunch with uh, Jeff Turner, the former CEO of, of Spirit. And he was talking about his first day at Spirit uh, in terms of being the CEO. And he walked into his office, sat in that chair, and he said his feet didn't touch the floor. And, I, and when I walked into my new office and I sat in that chair, I felt like my feet didn't touch the floor. I mean, I knew I was in the deep end of the pool and I was just praying that I could swim, that, that I could lead the church. Now, part of the context of the story, if you don't know it, is uh, I've grown up here at Pathway, I've served on the staff, and during all that time of growing up and being on the staff, Gene Carlson was the senior pastor here at Pathway. And Gene Carlson was the senior pastor here at Pathway for 42 years. And I mean, this guy was like a rock star. He is a rock star. I mean, he's a very uh, competent preacher, uh, just a great leader. And so, man, I was like, man, I don't know if I could ever kind of follow up, up to this guy. And, and, uh, and Gene, you know, growing up here, you know, and, and being on staff, he was kind of like the godfather. You know, I mean, you kind of were just kind of in awe of his presence, and he just did a phenomenal job uh, leading our church for uh, many, many years. And really, when Gene came uh, to Pathway, Pathway was about 150 people, and when Gene retired, it was over 2,000 people. And all those things made really a huge impression on me, and, and was a big wake for me to be able to walk into. Those things made an impression on me. But what really made an impact on me that changed me was Gene's character. That's what changed me in terms of the impact that Gene had on his life. Gene was a, a tremendous a person of, is a tremendous person of just of integrity, was a, a pastor for over 50 years, followed his calling, has tremendous love for, for people and people not only here in Sedgwick County, but for people uh, all over the world. And so much of who I am today is because Gene impacted my life. And as I was thinking about the, the book of Titus, which is really kind of the foundation uh, for the series that we're launching uh, today, that's what this book is all about. It's about making an impact. It's about making an impact. Like Gene had an impact on my life. And as we kind of transliterate that kind of into our own uh, time and in terms of where we're at right now, it's about you making an impact. You making an impact for eternity. That's what this is really all about. Now, when you think about it in our own uh, contemporary culture about making an impact, most of the time when you think about making an impact, for us, it really sometimes is more about making an impression. Impressions are real big for you and I in our culture. I mean, that's why social media is so big, and that's what drives us so many times uh, to make posts on social media so that they'll get light because we want to make an impression. That's why it's a big deal, because impression is how we think that we make an impact. Or another way that we think that we make an impact in our particular culture is we think that it's by uh, uh, some kind of position that we have. I mean, it might be a title, it might be a status, uh, it might be where we live, what we do, or even who we're with. But all those things, when you think about those, those impressions, those positions, all those things are temporary. They're temporary. They don't last. When a person loses their position, when they lose their money, when they lose their looks, when, when their term of office is over, their influence, the impact that they thought they had, it, had, it evaporates. It, it's gone. But impact... The impact that we're going to be talking about is totally different. Spiritual impact changes people's lives, and it changes people's lives ultimately forever. And I think deep down in our souls, 
That's what we all want. We want to be able to make an impact. That's what we want. That's what our, we're, we long for, to be able to make a difference in this world. And what's so incredible is when you and I, when we get aligned with God's purpose for how that he's created us, all of a sudden, you and I, we start experiencing a peace and we start to experience a power in our life that we never experienced before because all of a sudden we're aligned with the purpose that God has made us for and he's created us for. We begin to experience our best life. That's what we end up doing. And really, as we kind of unpack in these next four weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're really going to be talking about making an impact. How that in the end, when we get aligned with how God has created us to make an impact, we live our best life life. Now, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I just want to let you know I'm so glad you're here and the the principles, the truth that we're going to be talking about over these next four weeks, these truths can have a radical impact on your life. As you begin to think about them, as you begin to apply them, I promise uh, that, that God will use them in an incredible way. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, Uh, on this book that we're going to be looking at, the book of Titus. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to a young man named Titus, hence the name of the book, that he had discipled. And Titus was a Gentile convert. That means that, you know, the Apostle Paul was a Jewish man uh, by ethnicity. Uh, uh, Titus was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew, like most of us. And Titus really became the right-hand man for the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul would have a problem at maybe a particular church, like for example in Corinth, he sent Titus over to Corinth to be able to deal with some problems that were there. And now when we get uh, to, he had a problem in Crete. And so as he's traveling on one of his missionary journeys, he leaves Titus in Crete, his right-hand man, to be able to deal with some of the problems that are going on there. Now, Crete... Uh, in the ancient world, I was actually there this earlier this year with a group of people from Pathway as we were going on the journeys of Paul. Uh, Crete is about 100 miles uh, south of Greece. Uh, that, that's where it's located at. And, and Crete uh, in the ancient world was one of the most immoral places that you could go. I mean, it was kind of the Las Vegas, maybe, so to speak, if we would put it in our own vernacular the Las Vegas of the ancient world, and it was a hub of piracy as well. And so as, the, uh, as, as Titus was there establishing this church, I mean, for him, it was probably like trying to establish this church with the cast of the pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it was just a crazy place. Uh, Crete was known as a place where everybody, at least it was known as a place where people were drunk all the time. And, and lying was just commonplace. It was like an art form in Crete. In fact, when you look at the Greek language, uh, the the slang for lying is Crete, to Crete or to be a Creter. I mean, that's that's the reputation that Crete had. But we know in Crete that there was some serious problems going on. They they were facing division. There was false teaching going on. There was all kinds of unconfronted sin. In large part, the reason why they had all these problems was there wasn't anybody there that was really making a spiritual impact, that was being a leader there to make a a difference really in that church, first of all, and in the broader community as well. And so they were needing uh, uh, leaders there uh, to be set up, to be an example, to protect and guard the church that was there, to really make that impact. Kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, some things I'd read about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, in the Lewis and Clark expedition, there were many soldiers that were on that expedition with Lewis and Clark, and they had all kinds of problems. They had a lot of drunkenness. Uh, they had a lot of fighting. They had even people that would desert during the, con, uh, the context of that expedition. But I thought it was interesting to find out what the offense was that received the greatest punishment. The offense that received the greatest punishment for the men that were on the Lewis and Clark expedition. You know what it was? It was falling asleep on guard duty. If you fell asleep on guard duty, it was punishable by death. If you fell asleep on guard duty, it was punishable by death. You have to ask yourself the question, I mean, why was it punishable by death? Well, the reason why it was punishable by death is 
Because when you fell asleep on guard duty, you put the whole rest of the community at risk. You put everybody else at risk when you fell asleep. And as I was thinking about that in the context of the church, when we don't do our duty that God has called us to, we put a whole bunch of other people at risk. We put people at risk in the church. We put people at risk in our homes. We put people at risk in our workplaces. We put a whole bunch of other people at risk when we don't do our duty. Because don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. We, we have an enemy, Satan. And Satan's job is to steal, kill, and destroy. And when we're not intentionally trying to make a spiritual impact, when we're not on duty, when we're not on a regular basis engaging ourselves with God's Word, readying ourselves for that spiritual attack, when we're not surrounding ourselves with other followers of Jesus to be able to keep ourselves well-trained so that when we do our duty, we'll be able to do it well, we put a whole bunch of other people at risk. And I think we forget about that. We forget about it. We think our spiritual life is just about us. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, you think it's just about you. And you know, my, my relationship with God is good. It's plus. It's minus. The reality is, though, when you're not really up to speed, on duty, doing your job, you put a whole bunch of other people at risk. It's not just about you. Okay? It's about the, the, the impact that God wants you to be able to have, to be able to guard, to set an example, to be able to protect, to be able to lead out. That's why that this is so important and that's why paul is bringing it up here now specifically this passage is talking about raising up positional leaders in the context of the church but really what paul's talking about here applies to every follower of jesus christ it is we know that leaders are held to a higher standard but we know that the principles here that he's talking about apply to every follower of jesus christ so what does he say what does he say then in terms to Titus about how, how, can we make, how can you really make it a spiritual impact? Well, let's look and see what he says. If you want to open up your Bibles today with me, you can. Uh, you can flip in your smartphone, Titus chapter 1. Uh, we're going to dig in there beginning with verse 1. It says there, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Then he says, then first an elder must be blameless. All right, let's stop there for just a second, because I know if you're like me and you're reading through this passage of Scripture and all of a sudden it says, hey, you're going to have to be blameless we probably all have to raise our hands and say, no, I'm not blameless, this must not be me. But what I want to say to you is really what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says that a person must be blameless. What he's talking about is that that person uh, must not be, his public reputation must not be marked with scandal or lack integrity. That's what he's talking about. That every, you know, it's, if you're going to be a, a, certainly a, a positional leader in the church, and to me this is about every follower of Jesus Christ, ultimately, that really you can, your, your public reputation can't be marked with scandal or by a lack of integrity. That's the standard. That's where God wants us at. Because no matter in the end, so much of the time what you and I look to is we look to competency. Not a bad thing. Certainly God wants us to be competent, but what we do is we look to a person's skills, their gifts, their abilities, and we say that that is the deciding factor by which a person can be a representative or have an impact for the person of Jesus Christ. At the same time, if they've got all kinds of flaws, though, it makes a joke of the mission of God, of, what, of, the, of where God is really trying to take this world. And to me, this whole thing is very important because it kind of intersected uh, the other day when I was having a, a conversation with someone from outside of Pathway Church. Ran into a friend of mine from outside of Pathway Church, and he'd said he'd ran into somebody from inside Pathway Church that he knew was a visible leader in, inside of Pathway, had several different kinds of, of positions, said he ran into him the other day out in the, in the, you know, in the community and said that this guy, as he was engaging him, he knew him, all of a sudden he started dropping all kinds of F-bombs everywhere, kind of acting like it was almost like an art form, and then was talking about some of the partying that he was doing on the weekend. And as that guy shared that with me, really, uh, it totally degraded his perception of Jesus Christ and, and of our church. 
And, and his character, see, that's the deal. His character totally uh, short-circuited all the good, really, that this person had done, had been doing, but all of a sudden it, it short-circuited it. And really, here's kind of the bottom line that, that I, I want you to make sure and, and hold on today. Competency makes an impression, but Christ-like character makes an impact. Competency makes an impression, but Christ-like character makes an impact. You know, thinking back about my own story, Gene had all kinds of things that he did that were very competent, great things, great leader, but what made an impact was his character. That's how the kingdom of God flows. The kingdom of God flows out of heaven into earth through people and through people's lives with character. It can't get through when we've got so many character things going on here. He wants to be able to have a vessel by which he can move through. And that's why it's so important that we pay attention to our character. Now, we all know that those, that character isn't perfect. We're unfinished. We're in process. But, but we're moving. We're moving all the time. And we're doing all that we can to be more and more Christ-like. But in the end, it's dependent upon our character so that God doesn't want those character flaws to really short-circuit his kingdom being able to flow through our lives. So specifically, what does Paul say in terms of what is, how do we make sure that our character is in line? Well, he points to a couple key areas. Look with me, beginning with verse 6. Paul says there, An elder must be the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to charge of being wild and disobedient. It was a little scary for me when I read that. I didn't know if I was going to make the cut or not there. Children who are wild and disobedient. No, that, sometimes they feel that way, at least at home. But, but needless to say, sometimes you, know, you look at that. And really, I think what the Apostle Paul is certainly talking about families. And, 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 and really, in first century Crete, part of the deal was there, there was all kinds of polygamy, that means multiple wives, and promiscuity, sexual promiscuity that was going on. I mean, it was so bad in Crete that the, the Roman ethicist Seneca said, only the ugly are faithful. And so he's saying, hey, you've got you've to get this right. And really, I think, at a, maybe at a, a 20,000-foot level, the reason why that he really drills down on family, family certainly, to me, it's the, the first part of God's creation in terms of where we need to be. But part of it, maybe from a 20,000-foot level, is about being authentic in our faith. Because who is it that knows what we are really like? It's our families. Our families know what we are really like. And, and, re and a really, our family does give, a rep give some kind of a sense of, of what's really going on in our life. It really goes to the authenticity, really, of our faith. The people that know me best are in my family. And so what happens sometimes is certainly we try to portray something at church or to people that are followers of Jesus Christ, but yet... Uh, when we're not with people at church or we're by ourselves, we begin to be something different. Our faith isn't authentic. And our families know, though, what our faith is really like. And really, in the end, that they'll show what our, fa our faith is really like. But our, our families are the ones that know if our faith is really authentic. And so the question here to me that we can all ask ourselves today is, does your public, does your really your private walk match your public talk? Does your private walk match your public talk? Because so many times we start kind of talking like we got a game. Come here to church, look like we got a game. With people from uh, inside the church, we, we kind of talk like uh, that we have a game. But does your public talk match your private walk? And where your private walk really comes to bear is at home. That's where people really know your private walk. Interesting, I got caught a little bit sideways this week. I was sitting in my office at home, working on the message, and I can't even remember the context of the conversation, but my daughter Katie came in and she said, you know, um, I don't think that you're a, a very good servant at home. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so I was listening, and uh, 
And she said, well, a lot of times you bark lots of orders at us, but you don't come and help us. I thought, well, that's probably fair. That a lot of times that I was giving lots of orders. Now, you know, there's a dynamic at our house, obviously, but, but I think she was, she was on to something. That I was barking lots of orders, but I wasn't coming alongside and helping do things. And I had to look at myself and I said, hey, is my private walk... Is it matching my public talk? And I'd say, okay, I've got to make some changes on that. And it, and it was interesting when I had an opportunity to be able to serve my kids even in the last couple of days. And I had so many other things that I needed to do and wanted to do. All of a sudden, I, oh, I've got to have my <laughs> private walk match my public talk. <laughs> it was painful. But that's what, but that's what God wants. He wants us to get, get those things lined up. Does your private walk match your public talk where are you at on that well the other area that he kind of points to really is a an issue of in integrity uh, an issue of integrity look what paul says uh, in verse 7 he says since an overseer is entrusted with god's work he must be blameless got that word again not overbearing not quick-tempered not given to drunkenness not violent and not pursuing dishonest gain so Paul runs through kind of this, really, I would say, kind of an integrity checklist in terms of some things that classically get in the way of us really being able to make a spiritual impact. So today I thought we would do a little integrity checklist together. So what I want to do right now, I want to kind of walk through this maybe in a little bit more detailed way. I want to invite you to be able to take out a piece of paper uh, a pen, a pencil. You can do it on your phone. I'm kind of a phone guy now. I write all these things. And I want to kind of walk through this checklist so you kind of see maybe where you're at, some things that might be inhibiting you in this checklist. And, and we're, we're going through this not to help everybody feel better, but to see where we can get better. See where we can get better. So the scale that I want to give you is that if you feel like that you're really uh, growing to be more Christ-like in this category, you can mark a four or five. If you feel like you've been neutral in this category, you've been stuck, you haven't really been moving forward in the last year, but you mark yourself as a three. And then if you feel like that you've really kind of backslidden, it's a big growth area for you, I want you to mark one or two. All right? Okay, well, let's take a look at, at this list here. The first one that, that Paul mentions is pride, or in the New International Translation, it says overbearing. Other translations, though, they say arrogant or prideful. But do you find yourself getting more judgmental towards others these days? Or do you find yourself more accepting? Are you able to rejoice when other people uh, get credit and the spotlight gets on them? Or do you kind of try to pad your stat a little bit and kind of show other people uh, that, you know, you, you've got some things going on too? How do you rate yourself in this area of pride? One to five. Rate yourself there on that one. Second area, temper. Paul says that we must not be quick-tempered. How often do you kind of just uh, let the screen fall off of your mouth and you just uh, just let the you know just to let the you know turn the air blue or whatever in terms just let your words fly in, in terms of cussing? I mean, uh, do you use your words to hurt people these days, or do you wor use your words to be able to help people? Are you growing? Uh, in your ability to show patience to other people, gentleness to other people? How are you doing in terms of practicing passive-aggressive behavior? How are you doing in this area of temper? Mark yourself one to five. Third area, drinking. Paul says not given to drunkenness. Certainly drunkenness was common, as I mentioned earlier, on the island of Crete. And certainly when we kind of look at ourselves in our own culture, we could say drunkenness is a common problem that uh, people struggle with today. And really you might include in this any addiction that you might struggle with. So does your addiction, uh, is it having a stronger or weaker grip on you than it did a year ago? Does it have a stronger and weaker grip? And how's your accountability are you trying to just kind of make it through and suck it up and do it on your own and pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Or are you taking advantage of the community that Christ has put you in? Whether that be a small group or an individual or whatever. How, how are you doing there? Next quality has to do with the misuse of power. Paul says not violent. And certainly 
he's not just talking about physical violence, but he's talking about the use of force of intimidation in any way to get your way. Would you say that you're more or less uh, uh, a servant these days, more or less using intimidation? How about maybe if I say, how's your stubbornness quotient? How would your spouse say your stubbornness quotient is? How would you say you are in terms of receiving instruction from other people? So mark yourself, one to five, misuse of power. And if you're here right now and you don't have your pen or paper or your phone out and marking, I want you to give yourself a three on that one. <laughs> and, and if you're next to somebody who hasn't got their pen or pen or their phone out right now, I want you to give them a three and write their name next to it, okay? I guess we'll keep going. All right, the na last negative ca character quality that Paul talks about here is the pursuit of dishonest gain or money mismanagement. How are you doing in terms of your financial dealings, in terms uh, of your expense account, your taxes, your business ethics? Are they all above reproach? And are you growing to be more and more a generous person? Are you giving uh, away more money to God and to other people uh, in this last year than you did the year before? How are you doing in terms of your money management? So look through there. Where are you at in terms of, of, of things that might be inhibiting you from really making an impact? And men, I want to I say to you, man, if you look through this list and you can get in touch with it, things can be so powerful. If you begin to really deal with some of these character things that are slowing down the impact that God wants to really uh, do in your life, you're going to feel so much more on purpose, so much more powerful, so much uh, on purpose when you deal with some of those issues. And ladies, know that, that people around you are going to be much more attracted to you as a person in terms of a person of impact when you deal with those things. And you're going to be a person that you like much more yourself. You're going to like yourself more when you deal with those things that, that, that are, 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 are in the way. But where are you at on that checklist? Are you just out there in some way trying to make an impression on people like uh, that happens out there in the broader culture? Or are you trying to make an impact on people through the character of your life? Now, it's interesting. I, I read a story this last week from this book called Becoming a Person of Influence. It's about this lady named Helen Roswell, and she uh, had a student named Mark Eklund that she taught when she was teaching middle school. And Helen writes, one Friday, things didn't feel right. We worked hard on a new concept, but things didn't go well in the classroom at all that day. So I asked the students to list the names of other students in the room on two sheets of paper, leaving space between each name. Then I told them to think of the nicest things they could say about each of their classmates and write it down. And I took the, re they took the remainder of that class period for the students to, to fill out their sheets of paper. And then on Monday, uh, following that Friday, I compiled all the comments that the students had written them and put them on two pieces of paper for each student. And I gave them to the kids. And before long, the entire class as I observed them that day, they were smiling. And pretty soon I could hear whispers. Really? I never knew that I meant anything to anyone. I didn't know that people liked me so much. And people, the kids were just overwhelmed that day with all the things that all the rest of their friends had said about them. But after that day, the papers were put away and they were never mentioned again. Many years later, she writes, I was visiting my parents and my dad said to me, Mark Eklund's parents called last night. And I said, really? I haven't heard from them for several years. I wonder how Mark is. Her dad responded quietly. Mark was killed in Vietnam. His funeral's tomorrow. And his parents would like for you to come. Helen writes, So I went to the funeral and I stood there by the coffin one of the soldiers who had acted as a pallbearer came up to me. And he said, were you Mark's math teacher? I nodded in silence. As I continued to stare at that coffin, that soldier said, Mark talked about you a lot. You were his favorite teacher of all time. And after the funeral, 
Most of Mark's former classmates had gathered for lunch. And Mark's mom and dad were there, obviously waiting for me. I want to show you something, his father said. Taking a wallet out of his pocket, he said, they found this on Mark when he was killed. We thought you might recognize it. Opening the billfold, he carefully removed two worn pieces of notebook paper that had obviously been taped together and folded together many times. I knew without looking that the papers were the ones which I had listed all the good things each of Mark's classmates had said about him. His dad said, thank you so much for doing that. Mark's mother then said, as you can see, Mark treasured it. Mark's classmates started to gather around us. Chuck smiled rather sheepishly and said, I still have my list. It's in the top drawer of my desk at home. And then John's wife said, John asked me to put this in our wedding album. I have mine too, Marilyn said. It's in my diary. Then Vicki, another classmate, reached into her pocket. She took out her wallet and showed her worn and frazzled list to the group. I carry this with me everywhere I go. Then Vicki said, without batting an eye, I think we all saved our list. And when Helen heard that, she fell down to her knees and she cried. You see, that's a person making an impact. That's a person making an impact. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to have an impact on people's lives like Helen had an impact on that student, like Jean had on my life, like Paul had on Titus. God wants you to be able to have that same kind of impact in the places that he puts you. And it's amazing. You may not think of yourself as a person that has very much to give, but believe me, because of the power of God's Holy Spirit and the power of his kingdom flowing through your life and through your character, you can have a make an impact on a person's life that will last for eternity. Far beyond what you could ever ask or imagine or think, that can happen. And that's what God has created you to do. And that's what this book of Titus is all about. It's about you making an impact. You can do it. And I'm telling you, when we do that, there's so much power and peace and experience. It's the best life that we can ever experience. We don't make just an impression, but we make an impact. Well, as we begin to close today, what I want to do is I just want to spend just a little bit of time just talking about this whole dynamic in prayer. So I just want to ask everyone at all of our locations right now just to bow your head, to be able to close your eyes with me. And as we begin to pray, I just want you to begin to think about that list that we just went through. And I know that there were several items on that list that maybe were were strength areas for you, but I know if you're like me, you had some growth areas too. You had some areas on that list where you didn't quite measure up. And I don't know what that is for you. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's your temper. Maybe it's drinking. Maybe it's the misuse of power. Maybe it's the, the mismanagement of money. But what area is it that you need to more fully surrender to God in the person of Jesus Christ so that you can make an impact. What is that? Ask God. Ask God right now to speak to you. For Him to speak to you by the power of His Holy Spirit and reveal to you what area is it that you need to more fully surrender to Him so that you can make an impact. What is that? What is that for you? And as you listen to God's voice right now, and you begin to hear Him, And you know what that area of your life is that that you need to take some growth steps in. I want you to raise your hand and say to God, God, I hear you. God, I hear you speaking to me. I know the area of my life that I need. Raise your hand if you hear God speaking to you and say, I know what area that is. Say to God, I hear you. Raise up your hand and say, God, I hear you. I hear you, God. I know where you want me to grow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His hands all over. Praise God. Praise God, I, me too. I've got, I've, got, I've got a growth area or two. Let me pray for us right now. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word and for the truth of your word and the power of your word and that how it speaks to us. And, and Lord, we come to you right now and we just admit that we're not finished yet. We've got some growth areas. God, and we come before you and we lay before you our growth areas, our sin. God, where we're coming up short, where we made mistakes. God, we want to do better. We want to commit ourselves 
to be vessels, to be people that make an impact for you, that, that the character of our lives is in such a way that, Lord, your spirit and your power can flow through us, Lord. And so today, we give ourselves to you. Now, I know there's others of you here today that you've never taken that first step on the pathway. And I want to let you know that you can never experience your best life until you make the person of Jesus Christ the leader and the savior of your life so that he can direct you in the way that you should go, so that he can begin to unfold for you very specifically the purpose that he has for your life, to show you the ways that he wants you to make an impact. But this first step on that journey for you to be able to experience your best life is to make him the leader and the savior of your life. And so know today that you're not here by accident. Know that God orchestrated these moments so that you would be here so that you could become a part of his family, that you could become his child. So I want to invite you, don't miss this moment. Make Jesus Christ the leader and the savior of your life. Pray this prayer with me right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, that I've come up short, God. But thank you so much, Jesus, that you came and that you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins so that I can be a part of your family. And today, Jesus, I say yes to you. I make you the leader and the savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of eternal life. And now, Jesus, use my life. Use my life, Jesus, to make an impact, an eternal impact on other people. Now, with everybody's head still bowed and eyes still closed today, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I just want you to raise your hand real high right now just as a sign to God to tell him that you're all in and so that I can pray for you. Raise your hand real high wherever you're at and tell God that you are all in and so that I can pray for you. Raise your hand real high wherever you're at. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I see that hand. Praise God. Praise God. God is always at work. He's always here. Know that he is at work and he is always here. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much today for my friends, my brother, my sister that came to know you as the leader and the savior of their life. God, I just know that you have a plan for them. God, you've got incredible works planned out in advance for them, for them to be able to make an impact, not only in their family, not only in their workplace, but God, in this world. Lord, pour down upon them, God, just a sense of your presence and your power today. Lord, we love you, and we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.